This old house on a rural property just outside Collarenabri in northern New South Wales is the shell of a once grand country homestead. Today it stands silent and abandoned, but there was a time when this was a happy family home whose hallways rang with the sounds of carefree children at play. Then, on an early summer's day, evil suddenly descended upon this place. A terrible crime shattered the happy family. Silence the children's laughter. Do exactly what I say or I'll bloody shoot you. Now! And undermined forever the openness and trusting nature of country life in Australia. The fertile plains of north central New South Wales support some of the nation's most prosperous grain and cotton farms. The towns, for the most part, are small and the population numbers stable, except for the ebb and flow of casual labour. G'day, mate. How you going? Good, mate. Alan Baker. Pleased to meet you. It's to these farms that Alan Baker a violent, petty criminal in his mid-twenties comes looking for work in the early 1970s. OK. What do you want me to start? Immediately, if you like. Show me what to do. Baker is a stubborn, angry young man who has a fascination with guns. He calls them his equalizers. In the mid-1960s, he joins the CMF Army Reserve and learns to become a crack shot with rifles. At age 20, he's jailed for two years for armed hold-up and then takes a series of casual farm jobs. He's ploughing on a farm near Bogabilla and living in a tent when a former prison cellmate, Kevin Gary Crump, arrives in a stolen car. Crump, who'd formed a sexual relationship with Baker in jail, is illiterate, slow-witted and easily hey, led. Oh, it's all right. Yeah. Just kicking about. Yeah, it's good, eh? Yeah. Just cut from the case. Yeah? Any work up there? No, 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 nothing. The two work together for a time at the Bogabilla farm before constant rain halts ploughing and they decide to drive north across the nearby Queensland border. In early November 1973, Baker and Crump arrive here in the regional city of Gundawindi on the New South Wales-Queensland border. They buy a powerful .308 rifle, ammunition and two balaclava face masks. And at this stage, their plan is quite simple, highway robbery. Crump and Baker head back towards their camp in New South Wales. On a road near the town of Narrabri, they pass a parked Holden station wagon. Its windows open, but with no one in sight. It's a bit bloody weird just being parked there with no one in it, eh? They drive on until they find a suitable place to pull over and stage a fake breakdown. They try to wave down a few passing cars, but not surprisingly, given Crump's grubby and unkempt appearance, no one will stop for them. As night falls, they decide to drive back to investigate the parked station wagon. Its owner is sleeping on the front seat. Ian James Lamb is a casual labourer, aged in his 40s, who's recovering from a recent minor heart attack. He lives on and off with his mother and stepfather 
on the New South Wales Central Coast and has just arrived in the Narrabri district to seek work chipping weeds on cotton farms. He was unmarried, but he was wanted on a warrant for uh, failing to pay maintenance for a child. Apart from that, he's an itinerant worker. He turned his hand to fruit picking, shearing sheds, anything he could get a dollar out of. And he saved money by sleeping in his vehicle with a couple of bottles of beer to put him to sleep. Let's do this, mate. Armed with his high-velocity weapon, Baker now sees himself as a hotshot hunter. Thrusting the rifle through the front window, he calls out to the sleeping man. Hey, you! Ian Lamb dies instantly. Baker and Crump then search the body and ransack the station wagon. They steal keys, a wallet containing $20, and some clothes in a suitcase before dragging the body to the passenger's seat and covering it with a blanket. Oh shit, mate, we've got to find that cartridge. They know they must leave no evidence, so they search for the spent bullet casing. Got it? You got it? We've got to wipe all the fingerprints off too, mate. The killer will later mark it with a cross and keep it as a gruesome souvenir. The killers drive Lamb's stolen station wagon a short distance before turning onto the more secluded Bald Hill Road. They steal petrol from the tank before wiping the vehicle clean to remove all fingerprints. Then, leaving their victim's body locked inside, they head back to their campsite. It's Melbourne Cup Day, November 1973. Ex-convicts Alan Baker and Kevin Crump win a few dollars on the Cup before returning to their labouring work in the outback farming lands of northern New South Wales. Their betting stake had been obtained three days earlier when they shot and killed an innocent stranger, Ian Lamb, oh, simply to steal $20 and a tank of petrol. All right, that'll do. Virginia Gay Hook is a typical country girl known to her friends and family as Ginny. She had an open face, a gorgeous smile, loved to laugh, loved life, and, and there was no mystery with her. That's, that's how she was. And uh, people trusted her immediately because she was just a, such an open, warm, loving person. In the late 1950s, she meets a young grazier, Brian Morse, and falls in love. She was one of these ladies that um, always got what she wanted and uh, fortunately I was the guy. I went back to East Roscoe, which was Virginia's parents' property, and stayed there the weekend and had to ask Virginia's father, Frank, uh, for a hand in marriage. I mean, she was only then 20, and, uh, you know, I did all the right things, and it was... <laughs> it was... He made it as difficult for me as he poss possibly could. Her father made us wait for 12 months. We were engaged. And she supposedly wasn't going to be allowed to, to get married till she was 21. And I, I think we beat it by um, 11 days. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yes, he was, a, he was pretty uh, adamant that uh, this union was going to be the right one. They marry late in 1959 and eventually go to live on his family's property, Banawe, beside the Barwon River near Colerenabri in northern New South Wales. Uh, there was a main homestead there that Brian's parents lived in and uh, there was a workman's cottage literally 60 metres away. Um, 
and that was a tumble down little cottage and Brian and Virginia got stuck into that and within 12 months the, the place was an absolute picture and a fabulous little garden and <clears throat> so they'd established their own home and they had their first child there. After the birth of their daughter Eloise, the couple moves into the main homestead and a few years later they have a son, Adrian. And finally, in 1968, little Robbie is born. Virginia becomes heavily involved in the local community, joining the Red Cross and the Country Women's Association. She involved herself in the hospital. I was actually on the hospital board myself. Uh, yes, any, anything that was on, you could be sure she'd be there. Here at Banawe, Morse hires casual labourers to work in the ploughing and the harvesting season. And one of them is Alan Baker, who works for a few months in 1972. Virginia shows him all her usual kindness, and he eats with the family and plays with the children. On the day after the Melbourne Cup, and four days after That's Ian Lamb's murder, the killers decide to stage another robbery. So apparently he and uh, Crump discussed what properties could be, you know, held up, robbed, broken into or whatever, where they could get some money because the, the work was a bit itinerant where they were and, and they were running a bit short of money. So they, Baker listed about four or five properties of which they thought the Morse property was the one that held the least degree of vulnerability as far as they were concerned. Early on Wednesday morning, they drive to Mogul McGill, just over there on the other side of the river and opposite the Morse property. They park their stolen vehicle behind an abandoned police station, cross the Barwon at this causeway and head through the paddocks to the outskirts of the Morse homestead. They position themselves behind a haystack and begin watching the Banawe homestead. Because of recent storms, Brian's not planning any ploughing. He's going to drive the children to the school bus and later do some business in the nearby town of Moree. See you this afternoon. Be good. While they were lying behind the haystack this time, actually, uh, they're, they're armed with a 308. A baker actually took out all the rounds of ammunition and wiped them clean. The fingerprints, so no fingerprints would be able to be found on any of the cartridge cases. What are you doing that for? Fingerprints. No one will know where they came from. Loaded up again, and then when Brian Morse left, they went to the property. You do exactly what I say or I'll bloody shoot you. Get down on the ground. Now! Come in, mate. Get this bitch down on the ground now. No, no! Then go find some rope. And watch your fingerprints. What do you want? We want some bloody money. I, I don't have any money. I, I, I could write you a check. What got the bloody check? Well, maybe, you give it here, mate. There might be some money out. Thirty dollars maybe in the cupboard. In an envelope. Watch no. your fingerprints, mate. No. no! They tie Virginia's hands, then blindfold and gag her. Yep, yep, got it. Right, this bitch and get out of here. <laughs> Virginia is then forced outside. <laughs> You're a hostage now. Just keep your bloody mouth shut and it'll be all right. <laughs> they search the house several times and take a number of items, including rifles. Right, start her up, Kev. Let's go. Then they actually put her in the Morse family car and they drove it to a uh, petrol bowser on the property, filled the car with petrol, and then three of them then drove back to the Mogul McGill police station. 
siphon the petrol out of Morse's car into the uh, into their own car, stored Morse's car in the in the police station, and then they took off. Captain, let's go. For the terrified young mother, this is only the beginning. Former petty criminals Alan Baker and Kevin Crump have turned to armed robbery and murder in the northern farmlands of New South Wales. After shooting and killing casual labourer Ian Lamb and stealing his clothes and a few dollars, they've raided a farm, taking three guns and abducting young mother Virginia Morse. With nowhere to go, Baker and Crump simply head north along back roads that cut through northern New South Wales towards Queensland. <laughs> oh, stop your bloody whining! Crump does all the driving. He sees himself as the car's owner, since he's the one who stole it on his way north from Sydney. Please, Alan, let me go. <laughs> Virginia sits in the back seat with her hands tied, pleading to be released. <laughs> Please, Alan, the kids will be home from school soon. I won't. Shut up! <laughs> Crump watches the odometer ticking over. He always keeps track of the distance he drives. <laughs> Please, let me go. I promise I won't say anything to anyone. Just let me go. If you don't shut your bloody mouth, I'm going to stick a bullet in your head. Do you understand? Do you understand? <laughs> After a few hours on the road, he calculates they're exactly 113 miles from Banawe when they turn down an isolated sidetrack off the Mooney Highway and stop. Right, stop here. Come here. Virginia is dragged from the car. Come here, grab a bloody legs. Grab a legs for Christ's sake. Grab a bloody legs. It's quiet and hot. Virginia is thrown to the ground. Go get some bloody rope. Go get some bloody rope. Settle down and untie her, alright? Then, using ropes from the car, they tie her hands behind her head to a tree. There you go. There you go. There you go. She struggles and kicks as they tie her legs oh, to two other trees. <laughs> it's all right, Mrs. Morse, we're just going to have a little fun with you. <laughs> oh, <better now. laughs> and then take turns to rape her. You can go first, mate. At the same time as Virginia is undergoing her terrible ordeal, Ian Lamb's station wagon remains parked by the side of the Bald Hill Road outside Narrabri. It's four days since his murder and his body still lies undiscovered, covered with a blanket. Various locals drive past, but no one stops to investigate. They're used to seeing itinerant labourers sleeping in their cars. A truck driver looking for a local farm sees the station wagon and stops to ask for directions. He taps on the window, peers through and sees blood. Horrified, he alerts a group of men working in a nearby paddock. And of course, we didn't believe him. You know, I said, oh, that couldn't be so not out here. But uh, anyway, we, we then went down and rang um, the Narrabri police station and told them about it. And they said, well, could you go up and double check it? So I went up and double-checked it, and yes, there was a hand underneath the, uh, coming out from underneath the blanket. We um, forced the quarter-glass window 
on the near side of the vehicle and uh, gained entry, removed the um, blanket and saw the body of a male person and um, it was in a initial stages of decomposition, the body. Uh, and um, there was a, what appeared to be a gunshot wound uh, to the left side below the jaw. And um, it would appear, it appeared then that he had been there for some uh, time. The car is quickly identified through its registration as belonging to Lamb, but all trace of fingerprints have been wiped from the vehicle. There is no wallet or luggage in the car, nothing to identify the body. In Queensland, as darkness falls with Virginia back in their stolen car, the two killers drive on for another few hours, stopping occasionally for petrol and drinks. Clothes hung over a back window shield Virginia from view, and each time they pass through a town, Baker shoves her head down out of sight. Just stick to the speed limit through you, mate. Okay. Hold it down. Keep your bloody mouth shut. Shut your bloody mouth, or I'll put a bullet in your head, you understand? Shut up! All right, you can get back up now. How are you feeling up there, mate? You a bit tired? <sighs> Finally, Crump is too tired to drive any further, and they pull off into the roadside scrub near the town of Mooney to sleep. At Narrabri, the investigation of the lamb killings gets underway. The CIB in Sydney is informed, and one of the state's most senior investigators, Bob Bradbury, is put in charge of the lamb investigation. It was a very baffling investigation for a number of days because uh, we had no idea which way the murderer went or, or, or what happened before or after the crime. Police are then told that checks on Lamb in Sydney have revealed he has a minor police record and there are fingerprints on file. So Mr Lamb was identified from fingerprints, not the killers at that stage. Hey, you. But police are still baffled over the motive for the killing. Well, the car was... Uh, had been damaged by somebody who had punctured a hole in the petrol tank. We didn't know what, if anything, had been stolen from the car, of course, and uh, we were working on the theory that somebody had come along and shot him and possibly robbed him because they wanted petrol from the tank of the motor car. That was the only information that we could glean. Hey, you! and we had no idea who may have committed the crime. Here at Banawe, it's now late in the afternoon. 12-year-old Eloise Morse is on a sleepover with friends at Collarenabri. Her brothers Adrian and Robbie get off the school bus on the other side of the riverbank, where Virginia usually rows across to pick them up. After about an hour, when she hasn't arrived, Adrian swims across the river to row back to bring his little brother here. When Brian rings from Moree at about 7 p.m., Adrian tells him their mother isn't at home. At first, Brian doesn't think this is unusual. Hey, Adrian, it's me, mate. How are you going? Good. Listen, can I speak to Mum quickly, please? She's not home yet. Oh, OK. You know, I just thought she must have suddenly said, oh, I'm going to visit yeah. someone and and the car had gone. Can you just make you and Robbie a sandwich for me? I'm just leaving more right now, okay? So I'll be home soon. Okay. See ya. But when he arrives back at the homestead around 9.30, he's told Virginia is still not back. Yeah, hey, it's uh, Brian Morse. Phone calls to friends and neighbours oh, no. right. fail to locate her. I wonder where she is, mate. All right, come on, boys, bedtime. And then he notices the missing guns. All three of my rifles, I had a shotgun, a 22 and a 243.
and they'd all gone and I knew then that uh, there must be foul play and that's when I started to panic of course. Two criminals, Alan Baker and Kevin Crump, are on the run through the northern farmlands of New South Wales. Let's do this, mate. How are you? They've shot and killed casual labourer Ian Lamb <laughs> and have raided a farm, taking three guns <laughs> and abducting and raping young mother Virginia Morse. As detectives investigate Lamb's murder, a major search is underway. Police find the Morse car at the abandoned police station at Mogul McGill. Now, Brian, his neighbours and police have no doubt Virginia has been abducted. At first light, the killers shove their hostage back into the car, drive a few kilometres down a disused side track and stop on the banks of the Weir River outside the town of Mooney in southwest Queensland. It's still not certain exactly what horrors then occur. A judge will later suppress some of the details. We do know that by this time, Virginia is exhausted and that she suspects the worst. Come on. She's again dragged from the car. Virginia is staked to the ground, her blindfold and gag replaced, and again she's raped. We're gonna have to finish this bitch off. It's now decided that this is the time they'll follow through on their plan to kill Virginia. The two raise their guns and aim at their defenseless victim. Come on. We go together, all right? But Baker hesitates, and it's Crump who fires. Shit, mate. I didn't even line her up yet. Can't let's get rid of the body. Virginia is shot in the face. Without even checking to see if she's alive, they roll her body down the bank and into the river. They cover her with branches and rocks. After burning her clothes, they drive back south to their farm campsite at Bogabilla. There are no clues to point police towards this place or Virginia's body. No witnesses and no leads. Back at Colorenebri, the hunt for Virginia intensifies. My brother and I then jumped in a car and we went out to Colorenebri. It was crawling with police. Um, 
and we, I knew the area pretty well. Um, Brian was obviously distressed and trying to help the police as best as possible. Uh, the children had been taken by neighbours and were, and were taken out of the scene. Local members of parliament quickly arranged for massive additional resources to be brought in from Sydney, including extra manpower and even police helicopters. Well, I was up in the helicopters. Um, I can't tell you how wonderful um, Ralph Hunt, who was our local member, and uh, Jeff Crawford was our local member, state member. Uh, they just turned the world upside down. One of the additional investigators is Detective Alan Doyle. There were um, nearly a hundred of the local people came from miles around to try and uh, help with the search for her. Even some of the uh, local farmers that had it, small aeroplanes, they assisted as well. What I really remember is just an absolute sea of people coming and going and the women in the district, they were, they were there, they were, they were making, making sandwiches and providing sustenance for the searches for the police. The media is alerted. Virginia's description is circulated and radio news bulletins begin carrying appeals for any information. The same news bulletins also carry the first reports of the murder of an unidentified man in a station wagon on the Bald Hill Road. Detectives wonder if it's a coincidence. We really were comparing to see whether anything had indeed, uh, if there were any links between the two, but it was mainly a, a fishing expedition at the and, and seeing as we were so close. So um, that, that basically was, uh, they, they were looking after the lamb murder. At that stage, we didn't have anything to link the lamb murder with the disappearance of, of Virginia Morse. Over the next two or three days, we probably interviewed uh, half the town. It's not a very big town, but nearly half the town, I would say. One question everyone's asked is whether they know of anyone who might have a grudge against the Morses. But Brian and Virginia are widely liked and respected. Then, Brian lists off the names of the casual workers he's employed. And among them is the name of ex-convict Alan Baker. As a result of this, we circulated that he was a person of interest only and, uh, and his description. He had been seen in the area in about that time by other people and uh, we thought at least he was a person of interest. At Narrabri Hospital Morgue, Ian Lamb's stepfather arrives and identifies the body. He also confirms that his stepson had only a few simple possessions and clothes, which now appear to have been stolen by whoever attacked him. Find anything, mate? Apart from that, he had no uh, background which would suggest to us there was any reason why anybody would want to kill him or get rid of him. Detectives begin compiling a list of casual workers, but it's a difficult job. Itinerant labourers are often avoiding creditors or hiding from past sins. When the word gets out that the heat is on, a lot of them pack up and leave the district. We did all the customary things, went around, knocked on doors, saw the neighbours, spoke to anybody, tried to check on, the, uh, on the, anything that he had bought in the town, but we had no trace or no record or no information that would show that he had spent any time in the, uh, in the area. He was just passing through, we believe. Crump and Baker arrive back at the Bogabilla farm where they behave as if nothing has happened and continue with their work. But they are in no mood for work and intend to continue stealing for a living. After a couple of days, they drive south and the long trek to the lower Hunter Valley of New South Wales, the area where Crump had originally stolen the car. He'd once worked at a vineyard in the area and knows of a house where they might find money. But the burglary is cut short when they realise a passing motorist has recognised their stolen car. They escape before the police arrive and are speeding through the Lower Hunter floodplains when they pass a high-powered highway patrol car. 
Check the rojo, mate. Yeah, turn around, turn around, that's it, go. Yeah. 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 It spins around and gives chase. At this stage, police have no indication they're chasing anything more than a couple of local car thieves. Along the back roads near Maitland, they reach speeds of more than 160 kilometers an hour. As police from all over the district are alerted and rush to block escape routes. Near Maitland, as a patrol car pulls alongside, the fugitives slam into it sideways, sending it into a spin. The chase is taken up by another police car, driven by senior constable Bill Millwood. Then, the first shots slam into the front of the police car. All the bloody car, steady! I'm gonna kill this bastard! You're gonna shoot! Pull back, pull back! Come on, you bastards! Right, pull up there. Pull up. Pull over here. I'm going to finish these bastards off. Crump pulls the car to a sudden stop. Baker, the crack Shoot. shot, takes careful aim and fires. Take that, you bastards. The shot blasts through the patrol car's windscreen and hits Constable Millwood. It splattered the windscreen, uh, losing momentum, luckily, hit the policeman in the forehead. He may have fortunately had his head turned slightly. The bullet followed the bone line around and dropped out near his left temple. Although badly wounded, he manages to bring the patrol car to a stop. Right, let's go! Go! Other police cars then take up the chase, which culminates dramatically at a town called Woodville. The fugitives spot a police roadblock ahead and drive off the road. Guns in hand, they jump from the car and head for the river. Eighty police close in and for more than two hours search surrounding paddocks and along the riverbanks. They use loud hailers to call on the killers to surrender. A local Maitland businessman even joins in using his light plane. And these cunning animals got behind a clump of willow trees in the river and a fallen log, cut off some reeds nearby and were laying down in that river breathing through reeds behind the log and initially police missed them. After almost three hours, Baker is found, unarmed, wet and shivering. Then the search plane spots Crump hiding in the reeds. Police surround him and he emerges hands up. Ian Lamb and Virginia Morse's killers have been arrested after a car chase and shootout near Maitland in the New South Wales Hunter Valley. At first, police are curious as to why a couple of car thieves would stage such a dramatic shootout. But a search of their car reveals items that are soon identified as belonging to Ian Lamb and both are charged with his murder. There is no connection with the missing Virginia Morse until they receive information on the killer's guns, which include a .22 rifle. Well, we go together, all right? Police made a check of the rifles, of course. Found out it was, a, it was the rifle that we had circulated as missing from the Morse property. And that, as a result of that, they contacted me and Detective Sergeant Gordon Campbell. And Gordon Campbell and I then travelled to um, Maitland to interview them.
After a lengthy police interrogation and faced with the evidence, Crump finally breaks down and confesses to Virginia's murder. When told of Crump's admissions, Baker also confesses. And cowards to the end, they blame each other. The next day, we uh, asked them if they would be prepared to take us to show us where the body of Mrs. Morse was. So we travelled north in a sort of a cavalcade of cars. I think there were a lot of press uh, there by that time. And they followed us. At the Weir River, they show police where to find Virginia's body. By the time we recovered her body in Queensland and got back to Narrabri, uh, we had to work out just exactly what uh, offence we could charge them with in relation to her disappearance and murder. So um, we re-interviewed them and uh, established uh, that they had con conspired together to murder Mrs Morse. The police that actually did the investigation were absolutely horrified when we got the actual circumstances of what had happened to Mrs Morse. <laughs> we're just going to have a bit of fun, hey? We're still going to let you go. Hey? What she must have gone through over that um, period that, that she was held, being continually raped, blindfolded, gagged and tied up for all that time, knowing that almost certainly she was going to die. Oh, no one could ever think how bad it must have been for her. As details emerge publicly of the terrible crime, anger sweeps across country New South Wales. Yeah, well, the local uh, population were, were particularly um, distraught about this because they realised that they left their wives alone um, almost every day whilst they went out and did um, work on their properties. And sometimes their properties were so big that they would be away not just for hours, sometimes for days. And leaving their wives and children alone without uh, any sort of protection was never considered to be a worry prior to this. But after this, everybody was worried. A memorial service is held in Collarenabri. I get em emotional thinking about it. There must have been six or seven hundred people there for a for a memorial service in Collarenabri for when I lost Junior. Absolutely staggering. <laughs> I suppose out of all my kids, uh, Adrian has suffered more than any of them in Virginia's loss, his mother's loss. In June 1975, Kevin Gary Crump and Alan Baker were tried and convicted of murdering Ian Lamb, of maliciously wounding Constable Millwood, of shooting to avoid apprehension, and of conspiring to murder Virginia Gay Morse. Neither man showed any remorse. In sentencing both to life in prison, Mr Justice Taylor used some of the most dramatic words ever used by an Australian judge. For sheer cruelty, for a complete disregard for humanity, what you have done to this woman and to her children and to her husband is without parallel in my experience. What about a kiss for Mum? Don't turn around! The description of men ill becomes you. Now get down on the ground! Now! You would be more aptly described as animals, and obscene animals at that. I believe that you should spend the rest of your lives in jail, and there you should die. If ever there was a case where life imprisonment should mean what it says, imprisonment for the whole of your lives, this is it. Your first mate. If, in the future, some application is made that you be released on the grounds of clemency, or of mercy, then I would venture to suggest to those who are entrusted with the task of determining whether you're entitled to it or not, that the measure of your entitlement should be the clemency and mercy you extended to this woman when she begged you for her life. <laughs> Initially, the two killers are locked up together in the notorious high-security Katingle wing at Sydney's Long Bay Jail. 
some years later, after a public outcry, they're sent to separate prisons. Over the years since, both men have made repeated attempts to gain parole. The Griner government introduced legislation that was truth in sentencing. It had a mandate to do it, but it had a quirk. And the quirk meant that people who were in jail with indefinite sentences could apply to the court to have a definite sentence stamped on their files. On the second appeal with Crump, he was actually given uh, another three years and he was due for parole. And that's when I had to get in there and do something about it. I actually lobbied for, oh, it must have been three or four years, you know. I went in, I spoke to well, Bob Carr, of course, as soon as the killer's legal manoeuvres are over, Bob Carr's government immediately introduces legislation to prevent Crump and Baker, and others like them, from ever being released. These people would be effectively concreted in their cells. And that was the view of the original sentencing judge in each of these cases. And I think 99% I think of the public would agree with me that no mercy should be extended to people who'd committed crimes this horrific. That is the law now, that unless uh, they're insane or they're on their deathbed, there's absolutely no way that they'll ever get out. If ever any authority is considering whether or not to release you to obscene animals from jail, the, the uh, authority should give the same mercy to them as they gave this unfortunate woman. And they're still in jail, and that's where they should die. I mean, I'm getting some closure now, at long last, uh, and I can do things on my own terms, you know, I can talk about it if I want, but uh, knowing that they're incarcerated there is, I can tell you, um, it, it's very comforting to know that they will never get out. Virginia has been a no-go zone as far as conversation is concerned. We don't talk about the wonderful person she was and the fun and the little anecdotes and innuendos that, that, that come with interaction of people. Uh, because of the tragedy and, and the, the heinousness of the crime, nobody wants to talk about it, so she doesn't exist anymore. And this is where I think it is probably a lovely opportunity in this program, is just to be able to put some humanity back in it and and say, yes, there was a person there, and to be able to celebrate a little bit of her life uh, and, and give back some dignity to it. Mm -hmm.